Hey, welcome back. So now that we prepared to run the interview with our interview guide, we're actually going to run the interview. And I'll start a little unconventional, right? So depending on the product that you're working on right now, you may have an international audience, right? Or you may have people who just feel more comfortable texting, right? We live in a time where you know, people are used to text messaging or maybe multitasking while they work and it's easier to, to message you versus getting on the phone with you. Maybe they're scared of being on video, whatever the case may be. Ideally, you would love to have a video call with someone so you can get their expressions and their body language because those things are, are really important. Okay. But worst case scenario, having a text conversation, this one was over Facebook, it works just as well. And you can still follow your, your interview guide if people don't feel comfortable or don't have the, uh, the time and space to get on, a, on an actual call with you. So with that said, let's run through this and then I'll run through some best practices of, of user interviewing. Okay. So in this scenario, um, I had already asked her a bunch of the persona development questions. Okay, this is a, a woman who works as a designer for an agency and she works as part of a team. Okay, so I understood geographically where she was, not, not that that mattered a whole lot, but I understood her work environment and I started asking questions in terms of that, that same very question from before, right? So if we go back to the other one, you know, what tools do you use? Do you use different ones for different reasons? Um, and I, I asked that question of, well, do you use any tools outside of Figma for your design workflow? Okay. And it turned out that they use this tool called ProtoPy. So this was that spoiler I didn't want to give away in the last video where there was a, an incomplete feature set in Figma. Okay. This one had to do with animations. Okay. So she gave me some information about her view of Figma. Figma is all about cutting out the third parties. With Figma, you don't need to envision anymore, which was interesting because it's a competitor. So she feels like Figma invalidates the need for envision. But I must say that animations provided in the prototyping feature are limited. And I've never noticed this in my use of Figma because I'm not a full-time designer and I don't use animations that often and I don't use complex animations. So this one intrigued me quite a bit. I was genuinely curious about this. So um, she had said before that she was using ProtoPie, uh, her and a colleague, and explaining the complications of the workflow. You see it down here. One workflow we came up with is thanks to Figma supporting GIFs, we can export page transitions made in ProtoPie from MP4 to GIF and then run them in Figma prototypes. That sounds really complicated. Like animations mean so much to them that they do this really complicated workflow to, to make them work inside of Figma. And here's the kicker. Are you having to pay for ProtoPie? Yep, ProtoPie isn't that expensive for the tremendous value it brings, but it's the last fee we keep outside of Figma. Okay, so they're using Figma, um, the, the pro version, so like $12 a month. And I looked up ProtoPie, and I believe it was like 10 or $12 a month per user. Okay, so they're paying the same amount for one product that they're paying for Figma to get one aspect, animations, advanced level animations. So that intrigued me. So the value of these animations are so great that they pay a fee for another product and go through this complicated workflow to get access to this. So that jumped out at me as a major issue, right? Well, I don't know if it's a major issue. It's a major issue for them, but I don't know if it's a major issue for everyone. Okay, and this kind of leads to other questions that we'll ask later on in the process. But in terms of actually running the, the user interviews, um, this led to some really great insights, first starting with context and then coming down to actual problems and workflows. And, and one thing I'll say is you have the questions that you use, that, that use them as a guide, okay? If someone says something really interesting, like let's go back to the questions. Why'd you switch from one to another? If they say, oh, well, you know, this one was better. Don't just leave it at that. Why was it better? Okay, tell me about how you use that. 
So you can drill into each question three, five, ten layers deep. And I would encourage you to do that until you come up with some insight or they give you some insight that surprises you or intrigues you. Um, but yeah, don't be afraid to drill down from these questions. Don't just ask the question and take the answer and move on to the next question. One, that doesn't become very conversational and it gets really awkward. Two, it doesn't really produce the, the type of value you're looking for. These, these general questions are to help prompt a further discussion and have, have a legitimate conversation. So um, that is a great segue into what we wanted to talk about here in terms of actually running the interview. So as you're running the interview, again, don't be afraid to drill in deeper. Don't be afraid to ask different questions if they come up and are applicable through the conversation. Um, one thing that, that user interviewers especially when they're new at this, often struggle with is like deep listening, right? Um, part of it might be because you just want to get through the user interview to check it off your list and say you did it. The other reason might be because you're taking notes. And so you're so busy taking notes that you're not really intently listening. You're just trying to jot down everything. So what I would encourage is use some type of um, recording device if it's a written conversation like i showed you in, on from the facebook chat it's already written but if you're doing a phone call try to record it try to get it you can use free tools like zoom or, or other tools record the conversation so you can go back later and really focus on having a conversation with someone okay another best practice is is don't let silence become awkward often silence is a great thing some people think really deeply before answering questions. So don't be afraid to say, you know, why did you switch from one to another? And then wait, just like I did there. It may feel really awkward. <laughs> you may think they hung up on you, but just wait for a while and, um, and wait for them to give you an answer. Okay. Let the user that you're interviewing go deep on questions. Or, or go deep on answers, sorry. And, and don't immediately, when you think they're done answering, move on to the next question or chime in. Sit there for a second, wait to make sure that they're done. Because as people try to answer things, their, their brain is naturally working through the answer. And as they speak, other things are coming to mind. So let them finish their thought. Um, they may give you some insight um, that's one level deeper if you don't cut them off. And sometimes you have this awkward s situation where you think they finished their statement, you go to speak, they're about to say something else, and they say, oh, sorry, um, go ahead. And then the, the interviewer, instead of saying, no, you go ahead, finish your thought, um, takes that cue and says, okay, let's move on to the next question. Let's hurry up and get this done. Um, so I would suggest wait, make sure they finish their thought. And if you do have that awkward moment where they're going to say something, they are what's important in the conversation, not what you're about to ask next. Whatever they were about to say, you want to hear it. Okay. Um, the last thing I'll share, and, and this isn't holistic, and you can probably go look up a lot more stuff on user interviewing best practices, right? But another thing I would say in terms of best practices for user interviews is one, don't lead them, right? Don't, don't say, you know, Figma is better than Envision, right? And then uh, like, th that's a really uh, silly example, but make sure you're asking open-ended questions. Okay. You can get a little more targeted as you go um, through your, your discussions. Well, one targeted question you might want to ask, let's say you're on your fifth user interview, and I would strongly suggest you run five of them, okay, is if the first four individuals bring up the same problem, but the fifth person doesn't, that would make me really curious. Um, so maybe the very last question before ending the call would be, you know, what about this? and bring up that point that was brought up by some of the other people. 
And the last thing I'll bring up, okay, so the last thing is don't be afraid to let people go on tangents. Okay. You, you have your list, you have limited amounts of time, but let people go down rabbit holes for two reasons. One, they may bring up something that seems unrelated, but provide some interesting insights. Um, but two, it's really bad for the conversation to be like, hey, let's get on track. At, at some point, you may have to do that if they just go completely off track and you don't think you'll ever be able to get them back um, organically, you might have to uh, find a, a nice time to step in and say, you know, hey, so about this thing, can, can we, uh, can you elaborate more on that and, and nicely get them back on, on track for what you were talking about? Because some people do ramble, right? But that that's probably the the two biggest things are don't worry about awkward silences let people give people space to think and, and let, give people space to ramble as well and don't um, lead with any questions trying to push people in a direction that you want them to go uh, let them give you genuine honest feedback and work on your empathy and curiosity skills in this by um, putting yourself in their shoes as they explain this to you. Uh, try to understand them as best as possible and really be curious about them, their behavior with the product, their needs, uh, the context in which they, they have those needs. And, and you'll find that what you uncover from some of these user interviews are really powerful. And especially as you become a PM, and you're trying to share with the rest of the organization why you made a decision to do X, Y, or Z, these stories that come from real users become really powerful, um, especially the level of detail you'll get from this kind of user interviewing. So now that we've um, kind of discussed how to prepare for it, how to actually run the interview, I showed you some examples of it. Um, let's get down into identifying problem statements and developing actual product personas. So I'll see you on the next video.